And I'm joined by Dr. Stephen Siemens, professor of Christian doctrine at Asbury Theological Seminary and author of the book, Ministry in the Image of God, The Trinitarian Shape of Christian Service. Dr. Siemens, on behalf of the Henry Center, I'd like to welcome you to the Trinity campus and thank you for taking this time to talk with us about your book. Uh, thanks, Keith. It's great to be here, and uh, I think it's interesting that I'm at Trinity talking about the Trinity. So yeah, That's uh, quite appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you write in your book that there has been a, a renewed interest in the doctrine of the Trinity among theologians, and one of the concerns that you express is that that renaissance of sorts might not be as uh, well known among some pastors, Christian workers. And you say that you wrote the book to demonstrate the significance of the Trinitarian nature of God for the vocation of ministry. Based on your own pastoral experience, some of your interaction with pastors and observations, what place do you think the doctrine of the Trinity has in the thought and life and ministry of the average evangelical pastor? Well, I don't think most pastors really think about the Trinity or give much uh, thought to the Trinity very much in, you know, in their daily round or grind of ministry. Of course, most of them wouldn't want to deny the Trinity. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been taught that the Trinity is an essential Christian doctrine, that the Christian understanding of salvation is kind of bound up with it, and they might know a little bit about some of the heresies uh, uh, related to the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, uh, they sing hymns that are Trinitarian uh, as they lead worship, and when they uh, pronounce the benediction at the end of a service, oftentimes it's a, a sort of Trinita it's a Trinitarian benediction. Um, and yet, beyond that, they don't think much about the Trinity or talk much about the Trinity or preach much about the doctrine of the Trinity. I think part of the reason for that, too, is that uh, most people tend to conceive of the Trinity as, as a problem, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a puzzle, an enigma, uh, something that's kind of confusing, almost like a mathematical problem. You know, how can something that's three be one and one be three and so forth? And I think most pastors probably don't want someone to maybe ask them too many tough questions about the Trinity for fear that uh, they won't be able to answer them very well. So maybe just better leave well enough alone. Right. And uh, so it doesn't get... Uh, talked about or thought much about. And uh, un that's unfortunate because I've come to believe that the Trinity is is not so much a problem. It's a solution hmm. for us as Christians. It really helps us to understand uh, the world that we live in, the nature of God, and understand so many things about uh, humanity and uh, what we ought to be about in ministry. And so that's, of course, the reason why I wrote the book. I see. Yeah, I, I've wondered then would you think that most pastors deal with it if they're doing like a series on basic Christian doctrine or perhaps apologetics, um, how to defend the doctrine? But other than that, it sounds like you're saying it doesn't really come up. Right. And, 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 and so it becomes, you know, uh, something that, as you say, uh, we have to defend, help people make some sense out of. And, of mm -hmm. course, now in, in the world that we live in, with the rise of Islam, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, as an apologetic issue becomes even you know more to the forefront definitely but um, in terms of thinking about the implications of the Trinity for the Christian life for the life of the church for the vocation of ministry uh, that's a different issue mm -hmm. uh, and of course that's the thing I'm really concerned uh, about because I think that really uh, the the early church uh, formulated the doctrine of the Trinity not so much uh, for apologetics, mm -hmm. but because they understood that it was central to the way we live and move and have our being. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, raises a question for me that I wanted to ask. I was going to ask, and you've already touched upon it, did believers in the early church have a greater sense of the significance of Trinitarian theology for life and ministry? And if so, what do you think is... Uh, part of the reason for that loss? Well, it's, it's a, I, I think, a kind of complicated st a story in, in terms of how that's happened. I do think that the early church was uh, more Trinitarian in their thinking and reflecting on the, the Trinity, both in terms of the, the, uh, the apologetic uh, issue, because they were sort of, they were forced, in a way, to formulate, they backed into it. First mm -hmm. of all, 
their experience of God was Trinitarian. Uh, they experienced Jesus Christ as God. They experienced the Holy Spirit as, as, as the divine presence in their life. And so, in a sense, I think that uh, that's how they began to have to think about, well, what, what does this experience mean? Mm -hmm. And as they began to do that, they, then they began to formulate uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, to help explain their experience of God and their, really their understanding of salvation and the, particularly the role of Jesus right. in, in salvation. And uh, so they, they had to think through that intellectually, but it was also something experiential for them that was driving that even more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the Eastern Church, by and large, they've, they've, they've retained a, a stronger emphasis on the Trinity uh, in, in Eastern liturgy, in Eastern theology, even in Eastern art. I think of uh, Rublev's uh, icon okay. of the Trinity coming out of that uh, Eastern Orthodox tradition. They're still, they, they, they tend to be more rooted in the Trinity than uh, the, the Western Church, which of course is where most of us have come out of. And, and I think that if you, if you sort of trace the sort of history of classical theism, if you look at uh, Augustine, for example, mm -hmm. and in his theology and how he was influenced a lot by Neoplatonism, and a, and a concept of, of oneness that was so strong, it was hard for him, uh, I think, to, to really adequately uh, make room for the three. Mm -hmm. And even his great analogy on the, the Trinity, the, uh, uh, the, the analogy that's, that sees the mind and, the, and what's going on in the, human, in the mind uh, as uh, Trinitarian, you know, uh, that, that analogy basically focuses on the one more than the three. And, and, then, and then later on, Aquinas, again, influenced not by Plato as much as Aristotle, but still the Greek uh, philosophical tradition, uh, I think has sort of set the Western church up for a focus on God's oneness. Or bias towards the unity. And right, that rather than the triunity. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that then, I think, then coming down to us because those two... Theologians, Augustine and Aquinas, really shaped, I think, the Western theological tradition profoundly. And so, unlike the East, where I think they start with a three and kind of move toward the one, we've always kind of done it the other way, and in doing that, I don't think have been as explicitly Trinitarian as we've needed to be. Mm -hmm. you, you write, uh, you include a quote from Martin Marty that I found really interesting, and I, I know that it governed some of what you were trying to do in, in your book. And you quoted Martin Marty as saying that uh, today Christian books are either theologically theological or practically practical, and that what we need most are books that are theologically practical. What does that mean to be theologically practical? And tell us how we can go about moving in that direction. Well, the two extremes here, the theologically theological books, tend to be very dense and, and abstract and philosophically oriented, and the average pastor tends to just not even go there to try to read a book like that, mm -hmm. feeling like that's above me, me or how, how am I going to use that in my ministry. And then on the other hand, we've got all these how-to books mm -hmm. that are out there that uh, aren't very theologically rooted or governed at all. And so uh, a theologically practical book is really an attempt to bring those two together. And I think the key here is that we're thinking about theology here in, in terms of its relevance for the life of the church, in terms of its significance for us in our day-to-day -day lives as Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has said, you know, if you, can't, uh, if you can't preach it, don't say it. And I think that that which is theologically practical uh, is concerned about how do I preach this? Mm -hmm. If you can't preach it, if you can't uh, if you can't preach it, if you can't sing it, you know, uh, if you can't uh, teach it and communicate it effectively, and show why it matters. Right. And um, so I'm thinking about a pastor who's wanting to preach a sermon, perhaps on the Trinity, asking the question: Well, that uh, single mom. Uh, in my congregation, who's doing her best to eke out an existence, uh, going to work every day and burning the candle at both ends, and she's 
here on Sunday morning, and I'm preaching on the Trinity, and I've got to help her understand why it, that matters for her life. Mm -hmm. uh, or wh what difference does this make in the workplace that I go into every day? Uh, so I think that, what, that which is theologically practical, uh, first of all, understands the importance of theology, but isn't concerned uh, to see it as what you might call a speculative science, mm -hmm. that which, you know, uh, uh, exists in and of itself, you know, just... It's primarily, if not solely, theoretical. Theoretical, exactly. Mm -hmm. But you, you want to make that, that application. Mm -hmm. So you're asking that question about, you know, what is relevance and uh, how does it relate to things? And uh, I find it helpful. For example, uh, uh, in, in American culture, we tend to be hyper-individualistic. Mm -hmm. And lots of people have noticed that, and it, and it gets us into trouble sometimes. Uh, well, the Trinity, the Trinity actually stands as a kind of a critique on that hyper-individualism uh, that we see in Western culture. And, and if I can show how a, a Trinitarian understanding of personhood says that to, to really be a, a, a person, I need to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just about a declaration of independence, mm -hmm. but a declaration of interdependence, you see. Mm -hmm. And here I am trying to show the, the connection between this doctrine and something that I'm experiencing, that we're experiencing in our culture or in my life, then, uh, then I think people will light up, eyes will light up, and they'll say, yeah. oh, yeah, this does matter. Uh, right. But we, we haven't been very good sometimes in making that connection. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, speaking of that, you identify seven characteristics of the Trinity and explain how each should inform uh, or shape our approach to pastoral ministry. And one of the characteristics that you highlight is that uh, the triune God is missionary. And could you tell us, what does that mean? What do, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, first of all, Keith, uh, for the last uh, 100 years or so, as uh, uh, theologians and missionaries and people who actually teach in the field of missiology have have, have asked the question, what is the basis for missions? Uh, there have been those that have turned immediately to the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. Jesus commands us to go, so we go. And then, and then there have been those that have kind of gone back to the call of Abraham, or Abraham is going to be a blessing uh, not just to, to himself and his own family, but to all the nations. Mm -hmm. And so even, even there we see, you might say, a missionary calling and dimension. Uh, but theologians... Have, have, have been saying recently, in the last 50 years especially, that actually we can root the, 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 the mission, the, the, the practice of missions and the foundation of missions actually in God himself. And uh, even within the triune God, there is this impulse to go out, this outward movement. And that's what I actually, I think I ultimately mean by this, this missionary dimension that's there in God. And, mm -hmm. and, and even before there's a creation, even within the, the triune God, uh, the Father generates the Son. Uh, that, that's the way we explain that. Movement out of the Father uh, it, it generates the Son. Now, that's, that's something eternal. The Son's not created, but mm -hmm. there's, just an, there's a movement there. And then the Holy Spirit proceeds, and that word proceeds is also uh, talking about a movement out, proceeds from the Father or uh, in the Eastern tradition in the West proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there's this outward movement mm -hmm. that, that you find in God, and then creation itself is an, is an extension of that outward movement. The three persons go out of themselves uh, in, in creating the world. And then um, in redeeming the world, God continues to go out of himself. He sends the Son. And someone has said that the Father, then, is the first missionary. He mm -hmm. sends the Son, and then the Son is the second missionary. Uh, he, he, he goes, he comes, mm -hmm. and, then, and, then he, and then the Spirit is the third missionary, and the Spirit sends the church, and the church, then, is the fourth missionary. So you see that there's this uh, implicit, in the very nature of God is this sort of sending, mm -hmm. as the Father has sent me, Jesus says, then so send I you. So in being missionary, then we are, as your title uh, suggests, imaging God. Right, imaging God himself. And, and what this does, of course, is, is it, it 
it changes, it really reframes the question then that a local church or a pastor ought to be asking. Maybe I'm a pastor of a church and there doesn't seem to be much passion or mission. Mm -hmm. uh, mission to the community that I'm in, mission to the world. I mean, there, you know, people seem to be sort of ingrown, focused on themselves. And so oftentimes we think, well, I've got to, well, we've got to come up with some strategies to help this church become missional, uh, to have an outward focus. And so, you know, we, we plan and we work at doing that. Mm -hmm. But uh, understanding that God is a missionary God sort of reframes the question because w what that suggests is that actually God is engaged right now in mission. He's on a mission, you might mm -hmm. say, to this community where, where, we're, where God has put us. He's on a mission uh, to the world. Right. And so the question then becomes, well, how can we join God mm -hmm. in what God's already about rather than us sort of having to sort of uh, tr muster, it, muster up. it up, you know, and make it happen. We get to, we, we join with God and we participate in uh, the mission that he is already engaged in in the world. And so you mm -hmm. see that, that sort of changes. So then we have to ask the question, well, what, it's not some, it's, it's not how do we create a sense of mission, but what are the things right now in this congregation, perhaps, that are standing in the way of our entering in mm -hmm. to the mission that God's about? Well, related to that point, um, you have a, an interesting definition of ministry that uh, I'd like you to spend a little bit of time interacting with. You say that our understanding of ministry has to be shaped by Trinitarian truth as well, and you describe it as the we're entering into or we're participating in the ministry of Jesus to the Father through the Spirit for the sake of the church and the world. Can you, I know you can't develop that fully, but say something about why is that so important for us to have that grasp of what the nature of our ministry is? Um, if we fail to understand this, Keith, basically what happens is that the, the whole weight of the ministry gets put back on us, and it all becomes about us and not uh, about God. And... Uh, and, and, and the ministry then becomes really a burden that's much too uh, heavy for us to carry. Mm -hmm. If I understand, for example, that the ministry into which I enter is not my ministry, I'm not the principal actor mm -hmm. in my ministry, but it's the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's, it's my then participating in his ongoing ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, the battle is the Lord's. It's his ministry. I join him and... Uh, that takes the pressure. I don't have to make it happen now. I, I want to seek to, to join him in what he's doing, and I want to let it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that also gives me a lot of confidence. He's at work here. He says he will build his church. Uh, I don't have to build the church. I have to join Jesus in what he's doing. See how that takes the... the, the uh, and, then, and then when I know that it's not just uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ, but it's to the Father... Um, that, that helps me focus the minist my ministry. The question I need to ask is not what are the demands mm -hmm. out here uh, of the church, of the world, the human needs, people, uh, but, but what is the Father? That was how Jesus uh, answered his critics when they criticized things that he, that he was doing. He said, well, I only, I only do what I see the Father doing. Mm -hmm. So that helps, uh, you, know, you might say, uh, to give us a focus for our ministry. Mm -hmm. as we seek to determine what's the Father doing here. And then, of course, through the Holy Spirit. Uh, it, the Spirit, uh, ministry is not like rowing a rowboat where it's all, you know, us generating all the power for this thing, but it's more like navigating, uh, steering a sailboat as mm -hmm. we catch the wind and, uh, and we move along, you know. So I think this has uh, tremendous implications. A lot of burnout in mm -hmm. ministry among pastors today, uh, and sad to say, I think what we tend to reflect in, uh, in the North American context is our whole culture's uh, emphasis on doing mm -hmm. and uh, doing, 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 working harder and harder and harder. Uh, but you see, the weight of it's all put back on us, and that's a weight that's just too big for any of us to have to bear. Yeah. You say that understanding of ministry is God-centered and not me-centered. Yeah. 
Do you then think that it's possible for pastors not operating with that sense of ministry to be thinking, well, I am being God-centered because I'm doing all this stuff for the glory of God. Right. Uh, ex exactly. And so um, you might have a theology that focuses on uh, the glory of God and doing it for the glory of God, but it's, it's basically put back on you mm -hmm. to, to make that happen. And uh, so it's, uh, th th this is a Actually, taking it, uh, it's sort of like in the Christian life, some of us understand that, that we are justified by faith, but then we take the, uh, the, the task of sanctification becomes, well, now that's something I've got to do now. Right. You know? And actually, it's God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. He's the one that, 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 that actually affects that work in us as well. Right. As, we, as we, in a receptive mode, allow him to transform us. So there's a participation there's a, there as, as well. A participation. Uh, but it's, not an initiation. Yeah, it's more of a receptive. It, it's more of receiving and allowing him. Uh, it's, it's like the sailboat thing. I've got I've to hoist the sail, don't I? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that wind out there is not going to do any good. And I've also got to learn how to catch it right uh, and, and, uh, and to, to steer that sailboat. And uh, to, I'm not a sailboat uh, uh, I don't know anything about sailboats. Neither right? do I, so that's you a know, word so that, that, that thing of tacking, they say. And, and so i got to get good at, at, at receiving mm -hmm. and knowing how to do that and how to catch the angle right. Uh, but uh, that's different than rowing the rowboat. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly uh, think that you have done a, a great service to pastors in getting us to think through some of these things. And uh, it was a pleasure reading your book and a pleasure spending time with you this morning. Thank you again for provoking this uh, Trinitarian thought amongst us. Keith, thanks a lot. It's great to be here. Thank you.